Hello Matrix and welcome to another video. So we're going to keep moving on to question 4 on that very same uh, November 2020 IEP Physical Science Paper 2. Alright, so this time we're doing chemical equilibrium. So this is some of those questions that are very easy to handle, okay? Maybe the one thing that maybe scares some people is the stoichiometric calculations to determine the KC and whatever else they want other than, other than that this is a very easy section this is where you score most of the marks if you really struggle elsewhere okay let's see 4.1 says nitrosyl chloride okay pay attention to the naming of these compounds because sometimes you will see these names for the first time in your question paper <clears throat> so, and then when you see them again, then you know what that is. So, nitrosyl chloride, and they're telling us that it's a yellow gas, okay? That decomposes into colorless nitrogen monoxide gas, okay? And a green chlorine gas, okay? At temperatures above 100, okay? So, you see, there's a special condition. You can tell that when you heat this too hard, then the bonds break and then it decomposes into these two because if you have less temperatures then it's not going to happen which is what you would expect so that means for this decomposition to occur there has to be some heat here okay so that's the special condition for this to occur so at your bridge you must add heat and then this happens but if you don't have temperatures that are above 100 this is not going to decompose okay not a problem so let's have a look here we are told here two moles of nitrosyl chloride gas re, uh, decomposes of course with heat in excess of 100 degrees celsius to two moles of uh, nitrogen monoxide gas and the chlorine gas okay so we're dealing with gases and you can tell that this is an equilibrium situation so our rules for equilibrium will apply now it says consider an equation uh, an equilibrium mixture of nitrosyl chloride nitrogen monoxide and chlorine gas which is initially yellow green in a closed sorry in a sealed container okay now before we dig into this as we have been doing let us try and work out some things here before we go further so at times I always make the habit of just reviewing the electronic structures of these atoms that are taking part in this reaction because I want to know how is this possible and what sort of a molecule is this is it ionic or is it covalent molecule what is it okay so let's have a look now nitrogen is an element of group five okay let's see so it has five valence electrons right there it is and it's itself element number seven so it has seven electrons so let's fill them in so this is the 1s orbital 2s orbital and 2b 2p orbital Ah, Lord, no, that is wrong. The other one enters clockwise, the other one anti-clockwise, okay? So opposite spins, remember? So they, so it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So do you see, it can form three bonds with other elements, either covalently or it can shed these. But remember, this is a non-metal, so it most likely won't give them up because if you look at its electronegativity it's three of it so that's quite a lot so this one says hell no you ain't getting my electrons we can rather share all right not a problem and then let's look at the oxygen oxygen is element number eight element of group six so it has six valence electrons so let's see one two three four five six seven eight of course I just upset the orientation a bit 
so that it's of the right orientation to bond, right? So you can tell that, fine, oxygen has an electronegativity of 3.5, so it's much stronger than that of uh, nitrogen. So what can happen is these electrons can share these orbitals, okay? They can share them somewhere in between. They can only share, they cannot be a complete transfer because you can tell here the electronegativity is quite significant for each. All right, so now what about chlorine? It's element number 17, element of group 7. So it's going to be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. And then you can tell for its orbitals to fill up completely it needs just one electron. This one needs three electrons. This one needs two. Okay. So now, let's have a look. What is possible? So we can tell that, well, this guy can actually share this electron with that one, okay? So when these two mix up, that one can also do the same for whatever is missing. So we can see that this is possible, and these are all covalent bonds here. So it's a covalent molecule, sort of. Okay, so we can figure that out. And then, of course, when we do a Lewis structure there, it's going to be N, O. So we said O is an element of group 6. It's going to have 6 electrons, so 2, 4. Then let's put them there, and then the others here. Then nitrogen is going to have 5. So there's these two here. As you can see from the structure, the first parts are paired, and then the last three are not paired. So we can put these ones that are not paired here to pair up with this one. And then maybe there's this one here that is all alone. But we know we're bringing the chlorine here. <laughs> chlorine is an element of group 7, so it's going to have one electron mixing up with those. Uh, I don't know what I'm going to use, so let's... Maybe let's use a correct, so I mean tick. So this is going to be one, two, three, four, five, six, okay, and then that seventh one. So you see these ones form the bonds. Here you have a double bond, okay. And then of course the octet rule here is fulfilled because there's like eight electrons surrounding the nitrogen. There's eight electrons surrounding the oxygen. There's eight electrons surrounding there. Um, chlorine molecule. So it's pretty stable, okay? Not a problem. Not a problem. And then let's look at the nitrogen monoxide. Sorry. Ah, goodness. What is happening? Eh? So nitrogen monoxide so nitrogen we said here oxygen has six valence electrons nitrogen has five so we know that two of these unpaired ones are going to form that bond and then these three will not be involved so there's going to be a bond between those ones okay oxygen is surrounded by eight but nitrogen is only surrounded by two, four, six, seven, so it's not eight. So what happens to this one? Well, there are some books or some people who postulate that fine, there can be a dative covalent bond when this pair comes here. Okay? <clears throat> so, but uh, it doesn't really matter. <clears throat> but let's just forget that this happens but how happy is nitrogen monoxide? Well, we assign a charge here, so that the, 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 the target should be of these valence electrons around uh, nitrogen. We call it a formal charge, but I mean, this is, I think, advanced chemistry for you guys. So formal charge, how do we do that? For the nitrogen, we take the valence electrons, we subtract 0 0.5, into the bonding pair, okay? 
of electrons and then minus the non-bonding pair. Okay, I'll just write NPP. So now for nitrogen, let's have a look. This is going to be how many valence electrons? It has five. Then minus 0, 0,5 into what is this bonding pair? There's one, two, so there's four electrons in there. So we put it like that. And then how many are not bonding? There's three, so minus three. So this is going to be five minus two minus three. Okay, this is essentially zero, which is the target. So it should be zero for it to be all right. Okay, let's look for oxygen here. Oxygen has six valence electrons minus 0, 0,5 of the bonding pair, which is going to be just four in that case. And then minus the non-bonding pair is four. So this is six minus four, wait, minus two, half of four is two minus four, which is zero. So this means, well, it doesn't look like there's any need for this guy for that um, dative covalent bond because we're getting a formal charge of zero on each atom so that means nitrogen is happy with just those seven around it so these are some of the challenges that you get with these models of you know doing chemistry but yeah at least you understand but again there's electronegativity difference between these two so where is it going oxygen is 3.5 so the direction is going to be towards oxygen so you can tell that this is a dipole and in fact you would know that this is a permanent dipole okay it's a permanent dipole what about here well which one is the most electronegative of this one well you can tell there that well 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 nitrogen and chlorine they are of electronegative, electronegativity of three each, okay? So that means this bonding pair is shared equally between chlorine and nitrogen. So this is a non-polar covalent bond, okay? This is non-polar. And then when you're looking at oxygen and nitrogen, you know that oxygen has more electronegativity, so it's pulling it that way. So in the end, this is sort of a dipole as well, based on the fact that it has this sort of like partially positive end and partially negative end, because this one is essentially neutral. It's almost as if it's not there. All right, guys, not a problem. So now that we've reviewed a few of these things, so you can tell that some situations demand some special techniques to at least satisfy your thinking about how this form and then now well you can tell that the chlorine the Cl2 why are these things moving now irritating me let me just move my seat a bit back now when you look at chlorine of course I mean this chlorine can actually form covalent bonds with itself because another chlorine is missing one so they can form non-polar covalent bonds there so you know that cl is going to have seven so it's one two three four five six and then the seven and then there's another chlorine one two three four get okay, seven so these ones form a bond but again this bond is shared equally between the two so it's a non-polar molecule all right, so you know that these are all covalently bonded molecules. There's no ionic stuff here. All right, great. I'm happy if you are. I hope this doesn't sound a little bit too complicated, but I think what you would not know is this formula here of assigning a charge, what we call a formal charge. But in any, in any case, all you do is just say, all these atoms that are taking part in this, whatever bond you think is going on, but of course, this helps to investigate what sort of a bond is possible. And then when you draw a Lewis structure, you can do this. And then you just say valence electrons minus the 0, 0,5 of the bonding pair for each atom. And then the non-bonding pair for that particular atom. And if you get a zero, that should be the target. All right. 
not a problem so now that we've investigated a little bit of our molecule there now I think we are ready to start answering some questions so we are happy that we understand our chemical equation of course when you're doing the exam guys don't bother trying to do what I just did but you will see though why it is advisable if you can to think about it but don't put too much effort into it but you will see as we go along here yeah. the reason I keep doing this when I skimmed and scanned this paper I realized that it really demands this sort of approach but again you know what you're being taught and therefore you know exactly how these questions are so dynamic and you know what to do okay now we are told that this is initially yellow green okay but they told us that the nitrosyl chloride is actually yellow all right so yellow green because there's a bit of a green this one is colorless and then there's this yellow so when this is balanced so you'll have a bit of both okay that's why it's yellow green now it says define a closed system now in chemistry guys don't be fooled by your knowledge of physics and say uh, there's no external forces but in chemistry when we talk of a closed system basically we're just talking about a system just say chemical system where no reactants or products escape okay it's a system where no reactants or products escape okay but energy which is essentially temperature okay can be exchanged freely so that means temperature can enter or exit the system freely but the reactants or the products do not escape so I think it's a very worthy definition to remind ourselves of because you don't want to get caught of course the two marks is where you explain that there are no reactants no products that leave that system but you have to also state that temperature can be freely exchanged meaning it can leave or enter the system freely and you know that when you cool it you're just shifting the production of reactants versus products but nothing else changes okay not a problem so now we are told uh, nitrogen monoxide gas is added to the container at constant volume hmm. so if you're keeping the volume adding more molecules what is going to happen you are essentially going to increase the concentration of that nitrogen monoxide gas right and then now according to Le Chatelier if you're going to increase this part of our equation now the reverse reaction is going to be favored right to try and cancel the effect of that change okay so introduce a disturbance either than heat or temperature the system will do so even if you did heat or temper I mean you changed temperature there would be a shift so as to you know sort up that system but now we don't know here what is going on whether the forward reaction is exothermic or endothermic but my thinking is that if for example uh, let's just investigate which direction would pressure go there's three molecules there's two so if you increase pressure go to the side that is of less molecules right and also temperature tends to be directly proportional to pressure is it not at constant volume so temperature would somewhat want to favor that direction so maybe this is exothermic and this is endothermic and it makes sense why because they told us that you would have to add heat for this to decompose that means to go that way you need a bit of heat so in essence we can safely say the forward reaction is actually endothermic and therefore the reverse is exothermic but I mean this you would want to say cautiously because it was not clearly stated you know how these 
chemical equations can be strange but just reading it off here it may not necessarily be the case but I think we have enough information from the given statement to think like that okay all right not a problem so it says now what color change would be observed in the container after some time now we've added more nitrogen monoxide and therefore we're going to favor the reverse the reverse is a yellow gas so it becomes more yellow okay so the reaction mixture becomes more yellow so we can say the reaction becomes more yellow all right so there will be less green and more yellow because we are favoring the reverse reaction now it says explain this effect of adding nitrogen dioxide gas with, I mean sorry nitrogen monoxide gas with reference to the relative rate of the forward and reverse reactions and then of course I just explained that here if you're increasing the concentration of NO then this will favor the reverse reaction to produce more nitrocell chloride okay gas all right that's easy i don't know why they're giving four marks okay maybe you have to really put it in nice words i mean i'm trying to summarize here so increasing the concentration or the amount of nitrogen monoxide will favor the reverse reaction more than the forward reaction okay maybe let's say that uh, more than the forward reaction so to produce more nitrocell chloride and therefore the color leans more to NOCl than the chlorine gas okay ah uh, you can say whatever you want I mean I think we've said enough here uh, as to where the marks come from maybe two marks for each point it's possible or you need four bullet points it doesn't really matter but you understand what is happening there and then stately Chatelier's principle I think you guys already know this one I will not bother trying to explain this we've already applied it in B so all it says is that in a closed system okay when a disturbance is introduced let's just say in a closed chemical system when a disturbance is introduced this disturbance can be anything temperature pressure or concentration or amount change if this happens the reaction that favors the cancellation of that effect until the new equilibrium is established will be favored all right great that's it so here you just need to consult your textbooks or figure it out by just putting the words right but what is important you talk about disturbance you talk about um, the reaction that favors the cancellation of that disturbance and that equilibrium will be established again when the pressure in the container is changed okay pressure is changed the color becomes green okay now use Le Chatelier's principle to explain the pressure whether the pressure was increased or decreased so what do you think now we said here pressure once you increase pressure it will favor let's say if you increase pressure it will favor the cancellation of that pressure and where do we cancel it there's more molecules on the right than there are on the left so there's two plus one three here then there's just two here so if we increase pressure will favor the reverse reaction but if we decrease pressure the reaction that increases that pressure that means the number of gas molecules will be favored so it will be the forward reaction so how will this one be favored by a decrease in pressure so basically the pressure is decreased now how do we use Le Chatelier's principle here Le Chatelier's principle says okay uh, 
of course we're going to have to be relevant to our given equation we can say here a pressure changed favored the forward reaction judging by the color that became more green okay now there's more molecules of products on the right than the reactant molecules on the left so this means for the pressure to favor the reaction of more molecules the pressure must have been decreased because then the reaction would favor an increase thereof all right so it's a it's a bit of yeah you know sometimes it's a bit cumbersome really because it, it really is crazy so maybe we can say uh, the green color change uh, the green color change indicates that more chlorine gas more Cl2 formed meaning their forward reaction was favored hey 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 palaga biba fuet a bona ginking a say corner okay maybe this for marks let's just write it nicely let me stop being lazy okay because I think it's it's a bit fair to try and do this right okay so here we can say the green color change means that more chlorine gas formed suggesting that the forward reaction was favored by the pressure change now you can say since there are more gas molecules on the right side of the equation okay I'm just gonna write it here and it means the pressure change favored the production of more yeah ne? this is more <laughs> gas molecules ah uh, yeah they get fuel more gas molecules okay that is the increase of pressure okay therefore the pressure of the system was initially decreased okay I don't know man I mean it's very difficult but the Chatelier's principle talks about a certain reaction being favored sometimes you can't really say a lot but you can say according to Lisha Tiller's principle there was a favored reaction that cancels the effect of the change which was a decrease in pressure and therefore we know that the pressure was initially decreased it's really a very extensive thing here but I think it's better to write in bullet forms you see short notes but yeah so we said the green color change means that more chlorine gas formed suggesting that the form I mean the forward reaction was favored by the pressure change okay since there are more gas molecules on the right side of the equation it means the pressure change uh, favored the production of more gas molecules which essentially increases the pressure all right therefore we know that the change was a decrease in pressure okay 
I mean, there's many ways you can put that, as long as you will put it in such a way that it makes sense. Then you go with it, okay? Now it says, nitrogen monoxide has dipole-dipole interactions. Explain the origin of these dipole interactions. Again, do you see now? When you investigate your molecules a little bit, now you have one of those questions. I mean, this is not really common, but it's an easy question. Grade 11 will know how to answer this one because they deal with intermolecular forces in their syllabus, all right? So here you just have to apply it, okay? Where do they come from? We established from uh, doing this uh, Lewis structure that, well, the bonds that are possible between oxygen and nitrogen are covalent bonds. But because oxygen is the most electronegative, it will draw that bonding pair towards itself, making itself partially negative, leaving the nitrogen partially positive. Then, of course, how did we reconcile the fact that there's no octet rule satisfaction for nitrogen? We assigned formal charges, and then once we get zero, we know that this is the best we can go. So there's quite a lot of exceptions, eh, in those atoms in the periodic table. So we know that this is a permanent dipole. So if it is a permanent dipole, this results from an unequal sharing of the bonding pair of electrons between the two atoms. And therefore, the negatively charged side of another molecule will be drawn to the partially positive, and the partially positive side of yet another molecule will be drawn to the partially negative side of the molecule, and therefore you have those dipole-dipole interactions. So it's as easy as that. So sometimes some extra work looks crazy, but at times it solves your pain. But sometimes it's totally unnecessary and chows your time. So you strike the balance. So we can say uh, NO is a permanent dipole, which results from um, an unequal sharing of electrons between the two atoms um, due to the difference in the uh, electronegativity. All right. So we're saying nitrogen monoxide is a permanent dipole which results from an unequal sharing of electrons between the two atoms due to the difference in their electronegativities. Okay. This will cause a different, differently charged ends of molecules. to attract each other in dipole dipole interactions interactions okay I think I tried uh, it's not always easy I mean I don't write very well guys so I'm sorry for this but I hope you understand so we are saying Nitrogen monoxide is a dipole molecule, it's a permanent dipole because we saw it from the Lewis structure and looking at the structure itself as a whole and how the bonds uh, between those two are shared unequally and as a result we get a permanent dipole and that means the oppositely charged ends of these molecules will attract each other into what is called the dipole-dipole interactions. So. That's how you score those three marks, okay? I'm not going to say what in which part, but I think capturing the difference in the electronegativity is a point. 
saying that this is a permanent dipole is a point and then saying uh, oppositely charged maybe not say uh, say differently charged but maybe let's use the word oppositely charged ends of the molecules will attract each other in the so-called dipole-dipole interactions maybe this is where the three remarks will come from all right not a problem so i mean this is the easy part of uh, these questions on chemical equilibrium so let's get to the part that makes you all shake you guys <laughs> which i don't know why now it says graphite reacts with carbon dioxide to form carbon monoxide you know what graphite is it's carbon i eh? is the carbon solid all right to form carbon monoxide in the whatever that name is is it Bordeaux? it sounds french <laughs> maybe it's Bordeaux reaction you don't always pronounce the last syllable so Bordeaux or Bordeaux. maybe let's be french Bordeaux. Bordeaux. <laughs> hey there's no time for fun here anyway there's the equation i'm not gonna try to teach you know carbon dioxide we explored it in question one and we found it to be a non-polar because of the distribution of those charges but it is itself made up of covalent bonds all right and then carbon monoxide more or less the same thing and it's highly reactive than carbon dioxide that one okay they are also non-polar all right now the problem now we are told here, yeah, 36 grams of graphite were mixed with 66 grams. So once you are given the grams, you know you're going to have to do the number of moles, okay? Of carbon dioxide, wait, okay, 36, 36 grams. So the mass of graphite here is 36 grams. And then the mass of carbon dioxide uh, is 66 grams. okay in a 400 centimeter cubed so you'll always be given the volume of the container and the container was then sealed at a particular temperature now at equilibrium it was noted that two moles of graphite remained okay so that means we used up some and this is what remained now it says determine the equilibrium constant at this temperature okay this is fun so let's do it nice and easy. Where's my stuff? Let's just go for it. Yeah. So let's just do it. I'll just rewrite here this part. So 4.2, so we have graphite plus carbon dioxide gas going forward and backward to two molecules of carbon monoxide gas all right great so obviously all we need to know is what was the number of moles at the beginning here so number of moles for graphite is going to be the mass which is 36 i'm not going to write the formula guys you should know it and then what is the molar mass of carbon is 12 i think yeah 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 yeah. so you know that there's no doubling there so just want to know the initial number of moles i'm just gonna jump in 36 divided by 12 so it was three moles okay and then what was the number of moles of carbon dioxide maybe let's use another color to avoid confusion so the number of moles of carbon dioxide, we were told it's 66 over carbon dioxide, it's going to be 12 plus 16 by 2 is 32. Okay, oxygen's molar mass is 16, so since it's double, so you're going to double that. So this is essentially what? 46, 38, hmm? yeah not it's 44 actually 44 yeah it's 44 okay so we're going to have 66 divided by 44 which is 1 comma 5 more all right so
so of course this is what we started with all right that is very important so all we can say here we can say initial number of moles for each we started with three and then here was 1,5 okay and then of course we went to that side and what did we get at the beginning there shouldn't be anything right not so here we can say used or produced what did we use is what we're going to find out we can say now number of moles at equilibrium uh, so we were told here that um, two moles were left here then of course um, we don't know how many there were here so we're going to jump this one and then we also don't know how many but now we can actually determine the used by taking that and subtracting that so we can see that it's just one more okay so 3 minus 2 we have 1 so this is 1 to 1 so only one mole also was used here okay so now how many did we produce so we know that one you can either use this or can use that produces two so we just double this one so it's going to be two more okay not a problem and if you add zero to two at equilibrium we're going to have here just two more okay now 1.5 minus one is going to be 0 0.5 more okay happy right stuff and then we can say now the equilibrium concentration for each now equilibrium concentration so it is going to be the number of moles divided by volume that volume is 400 centimeter cubed so we use decimeter cubed so we divide by a thousand and then I have 0, 0,4 so this is going to be 0, 0,4 all right and then also here the concentration is 0, 0,5 divided by 0, 0,4 this is 2 divided by 0, 0,4 all right now let's see what those answers are all right let's start with that one 2 divided by 0, 0,4 is 5 so this is now mole per decimeter cubed okay this one here 0, 0,5 divided by 0, 0,4 it's 1,25 mole per decimeter cubed all right then here we have 2 divided by uh, it's gonna be the same as that one right yeah it's gonna be 5 all per decimeter cubed so I don't need to stress myself there so now that we have these molar concentrations at equilibrium what is next KC is defined by the products so it's going to be carbon monoxide but there's a coefficient there so that one goes to the numerator so it's going to be squared over now the solid is 1 so it doesn't really have to feature or you can write it and then put 1 it's up to you so I'll just go for the CO2 again there's no balancing coefficient there so we leave it like that remember this one doesn't qualify as okay not a problem so let's see what is that it's 5 squared divide by 1,25 okay so that's what we have so let's see what do we have here 5 squared divided by 1,25 I get 20 okay so we know that our case is significant because remember the acceptable one I don't want to dig a hole for myself though uh, it's 0, 0,0 one and a thousand 
sometimes I forget this one so if I forgot so anything in between it tells you that your system is more balanced it's not favoring the other but when it's less than this then it means your reaction lies far to the left meaning there's more reactants than products if it is more than a thousand then it means there's more products than the reactants so the reaction the balance lies far to the right okay so this is just the case here range it's not a big deal so this is quite significant so we can accept that this is indeed in balance okay guys this is how you get your eight marks i think here yeah, because you had to determine that it's a mark you had to determine those two those are marks and you had to determine that two those were marks right so we have one two three four five six <laughs> seven ah uh, word eight goodness all right so that is how you can think of it i mean this is easy as you can see we really did not suffer at all here so yeah hey i think we took forever now let's just finish this thing don't like to take forever you know but i just start to enjoy this too much maybe okay that's how you can get that okay uh, equilibrium constant calculator I mean this is the easiest way it can be asked otherwise it can be a little bit more complicated now let's see carbon dioxide has a boiling point of minus 78 degrees Celsius okay whereas chlorine gas has a boiling point of minus 34 so minus 34 is greater than minus 78 okay Given that both carbon dioxide and chlorine gas are non-polar molecules with the same type of intermolecular forces and you know very well that these are the so-called London forces, okay? Fully account for this difference in boiling point. Who? Five marks. Okay. So how do you tell what is going to happen here? Now, we know these are both, they both have London forces, right? Right. And then, now how can they have differences in terms of their boiling points? All right, now let's have a look at these molecules nice and easy. Nice and easily. All right, so this is not a very easy question. So you see guys, you see guys, I thought I was giving additional information. <laughs> And this information just comes in handy. So you see, investigating these molecules will help you a lot. Now, remember, you're going to consider these as molecules. So think of this. Let's use the Niels Bohr. Now, we have a nucleus here. There's a plus that comes from the nitrogen. There's a plus that comes... Ah, man, come on, man. I hate this thing. Why does it do this, man? And yes. Now we have all these electrons circulating around. Remember, this is carbon dioxide. This is the carbon, this is the oxygen. The nuclear ye are now forming the core. Then you have your electrons circulating around. Think of it like this now, using the Bohr model. Now let's look at the chlorine. Uh, So we have the chlorine, of course, this is what would be their centers. And then there's going to be electrons around it. Now, let's just put more because there's going to be more electrons there than you would see there. Now, how do I know this? Let's look at the periodic table. So what would be the valency? Because we're just focusing on the electrons on the outside. So the valence electrons is going to be the valency of carbon plus the valency of oxygen. Carbon is an element of group 5, so it's going to be 5 plus those of oxygen. They are 8, but now you're going to have 8 times 2 because there's two molecules of oxygen there in carbon dioxide, okay? So this is CO2. So now what you have here is 16 plus 5. No, 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 yay. They are 6, man. 
the valence electrons of uh, I when I'm on. what are you saying carbon is an element of group 4 so it has 4 valence electrons oh, sorry guys I'm losing concentration so this is going to be um, let's see Oh, CO2. Let's look at the valence electrons here. For oxid, for carbon, right? There's how many? It's an element of group four. It's gonna have four valence electrons. So I'm just focusing on the electrons in the outer energy structure, okay? Plus, now the valence electrons for oxygen. They are what? Element of group six, so there's six of them. But now these sixes are double, so you're going to multiply that by two. So this is now twelve plus four, which is sixteen. Okay, now let's look at this one, the chlorine molecule. So element of group seven, so it has seven electrons yeah, yeah, yeah. valence electrons seven and plus another seven yeah in a ties of sevens and immortal this is not going to work so this is 14 I call funny king I much why let's look at the overall okay let's just look at the total number of electrons so it looks like looking at the valence electrons is not gonna help because look carbon dioxide has more than this so we are in trouble so let's look at the overall number of electrons um, yeah don't think about that so let's look at the number of electrons in these molecules now oxygen contributes eight okay uh, carbon contributes six so it's six plus eight of oxygen times two all right so this is 16 plus 6, which is 22. Ne? Think so. So we have 22 electrons in total. And then they are all circulating in the orbit. Okay. And then let's look at the chlorine number of electrons here. It's going to be what? It's element number 17. So there's 17 plus 17, which is 30. What? The winner. It's 34, eh? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, man, it's 34 electrons. So do you see there's more electrons in chlorine than there are in the carbon dioxide molecule? Now, there is this description that says, because these guys are in constant motion, these ones are moving clockwise, these ones are moving... Actually, they all move like that. You can say this one is clockwise, yeah. We're saying opposite spins, but it doesn't really matter, man. These ones are moving that way, these ones are moving that way. Opposite spins, basically. But in essence, they're going clockwise, if you think about it. Okay. Now, what is going to happen? We know that having been seen in experiments using the helium atom, there are instances where... Some electrons, for some reason, they lose their energy and then they don't move as fast. And you find that now, our molecule here, you have electrons all bunched up on the one side of the molecule, such that you have this end of the molecule that looks more positive because it lacks electrons, and then this end that has more negative. So it forms what we call an induced dipole okay within one molecule so there are instances just like the water molecule can sort of break into you know some of its parts but not so much of this happens so this is instantaneous okay it's instantaneous it doesn't last very long all right so this is what is going to happen same will happen for our chlorine molecule you may find that there's more electrons these electrons are all bunched up on one end creating this negative pole and that positive pole okay this is because of the constant motion of these electrons but because of their differences in energies you may find that 
these electrons remember the valence electrons move faster than the ones that are inside so you may find that at some point the valence electrons have caught up with the side of the slower ones and then there's more electrons than there are positive charges on that end so we're getting this now the number of electrons now will determine exactly the strength of those dipoles right now the one that has more electrons will have a stronger sort of dipole attraction than the one with less electrons isn't it because the more the merrier isn't it now that means when these molecules come together with you know another one like it uh, you find that now these electrons are bunched up on this side so there will be these dipole dipole interactions sort of okay because there's more electrons versus positive charges when this happens these ones will be stronger because of more electrons then it would be the case for that one H yani for the chemistry of weight so this one would be positive with that one negative and then they will attract again forming the so-called dipole dipole so these are the London forces basically so the London forces are essentially called induced dipole induced <laughs> dipole forces hey. yeah now this word doesn't make sense that's another name for London forces so they are called induced dipole induced forces meaning the atom because of these instances where these molecules have more electrons on one side than they are on the other side so it creates this induced dipole and then as a result when these now attract each other when this happens for two molecules that are close together then we get this induced dipole but of course their strength now will depend on the number of electrons present in each molecule you can see that the chlorine one has more electrons than the um, carbon dioxide one therefore these ones are going to be much stronger than these ones and therefore that explains why the chlorine gas uh, molecules take a little bit more energy to break than the carbon dioxide ones i hope that makes sense guys all right, so grade 11s know this. So if you're in grade 12 and you don't remember this, please refresh it. That's why you're not supposed to sell those books or give them away. Keep them until you are done with your career, I tell you. Because even adversity will still need to refresh some of the basics that are in your lower levels, which is grade 10, 11, and 12. All right, guys, I think we've explained that one. So. Now let's just put it in words so that we can seal this question. I took forever and I didn't mean to, but sometimes it happens. So I just pray, man, we're still under an hour. So we can just say uh, CO2 and Cl2 have Weak, we can just say weak London forces, okay, which are called induced dipole induced <laughs> dipole. Damn it, this is like tautology dipole forces, okay, okay, between. They are molecules. Now I can say due to electrons moving constantly in their orbits around the nuclei of these molecules there are instances of electrons being found on one end of the molecule 
molecules creating induced dipoles which will attract uh, each other okay uh, into induced dipole <laughs> induced hey dipole here when forces yeah okay sigma shagale magunch to two more electrons in the Cl2 than in CO2. The Cl2 interactions will be stronger and therefore needing more energy to separate them. Hence, the differences yay, in boiling points, ish, boiling points of the two substances. Okay, let's just say substances. I mean, come on, guys, this is crazy. You wouldn't have to write such an essay. But for five marks, ish, you just want to do this as good as you can. I mean, you guys write well already, so you probably would know what to do. But let's just recap. I said carbon dioxide and chlorine gas have weak London forces, the so called induced dipole induced dipole. It's like me repeating myself forces. Now between the um, uh, now between okay so we're saying this this uh, weak London forces between their molecules okay now due to electrons moving constantly in their orbits around the nuclei of these molecules now there are instances just make sure this is instances or instantaneous you know events they don't last very long okay. There are instances of electrons being found on one end of the molecules creating induced dipoles, okay, which will attract each other into induced dipole induced dipole forces or interactions. Now due to the electrons, I mean due to more electrons in the chlorine than in the carbon dioxide, <laughs> okay, the chlorine molecules will be, I mean interactions or forces will be stronger and therefore needing more energy to separate them. Uh, okay, hence the difference in their boiling points. Of course, guys, this is ridiculous. You see, I'm even struggling to read my own writing. But again, what is killing me here is my position. So you can't do all and succeed in all, okay? If this camera would not be in my way so that you cannot have an obstructed view, I would probably write much better. Otherwise, guys, that's how you can crack that. Uh, you get your five marks. We're not going to try and see where those marks are. But you can see there, you can really compress these into bullet points. I mean, you can see that this looks busy and a lot. But it's because there's just more words, but that don't mean much. So if you capture the keywords that these two have weak London forces between there, they are molecules. And two, due to electron motion in the orbits, there are instances where electrons are on one end in each molecule creating dipoles and these dipoles will attract each other. But due to the number of electrons within these molecules, then the ones for chlorine with more molecules, they will have more stronger uh, London forces than you would find in the carbon dioxide. And that is why they are different in terms of their boiling points, meaning the one with more electrons will need more energy to separate those molecules than it would be the case with the other, which is carbon dioxide. Otherwise, 
that's how you can score that 29 marks it's a bit extensive chapter here so they really really tried to integrate it and I'm glad though that it came at the right time when I was in the mood to give you as much as I can hope you guys enjoyed the lesson and then of course please forgive me for the writing it's horrible I know so don't even try to read it try to listen more in what I say and write it down maybe then you can read it in your own handwriting then it's gonna be much better but I'll improve as soon as I can learn how to use electronic stuff I'll probably do better than I am doing right now but that also is a bit of a challenge I'm practicing at the moment so it's not really coming all right as yet but yeah I hopefully in no time will do better by using the electronic stuff at least I'm gonna be more at ease than it is the case at the moment otherwise guys uh, thank you for watching I hope you are learning as much as you wish to and if that's the case give it a thumbs up and hit that notification bell so that you don't miss out when there's more lessons being posted by me for your benefit I'll see you in the next video Bye-bye.